Welcome everybody once again. Uh, I'm Mayor Mike and we are Talking Point. Today with us we have our Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator Mark Cordes uh, and representing the Central Wisconsin Apartment Association, Travis Haynes. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. What we wanted to talk about uh, a little bit uh, are some of the property maintenance issues that we see and some of the challenges that we face as property owners or maybe landlords or maybe from a tenant's perspective even. Um, where we've been, how we got to where we are now, and the significant improvements that we have. So why don't we start out with um, Mark. Mark, you've been with the city now for a couple of years um, and have made, in my opinion, great strides in getting compliance because the goal is never about penalizing somebody or giving them a fine the goal is just complying with the ordinances and we've had a a longer history of maybe some less than um a, a consistent enforcement let's talk about a little uh, your job and and sure. what that entails well a portion of my job is code enforcement but a as you said really the goal is to get people to comply so uh, I think a different approach we took right from the get-go was uh, education and letting people know what they're doing is, is maybe uh, wrong or, or there's, um, there's an ordinance that, that regulates you know, parking on the grass or that they have to cut their grass, shovel their snow, those sorts of things. Um, one of the first things I did when I started with the city was develop a, a pink slip program. It's essentially a sticky note that we can put on either people's trash cans if they leave them at the curb too long, or if they're parked in the wrong location, or they have um, a couch at the curb that they think somebody is going to pick up. And we'd, we'd leave the pink slip, we come back and check it in 24 to 48 hours. So we're getting compliance in 24 to 48 hours versus you know two weeks with many of these items. Uh, on top of it, the challenge with rental properties is we would send the letter out and it would go only to the landlord, and then the landlord would have to track down the tenant and find the right tenant for you know perhaps a violation, and, and there may be four, six, eight tenants living in a, in a building, and they didn't know, you know, who the violator was. So there was a disconnect there. I think that's made a. a I think we've made a lot of progress through implementing that. We get quicker compliance. We're targeting the people that potentially don't know about the ordinance or are the violating a section of the ordinance. And I, I don't know how that's worked uh, for Travis and with the rental properties that they manage. I'd say it's worked fantastic. And honestly, I would I would give kudos to the city for the direction they went with with Mark on this here because we took what was somewhat of a negative experience, which you know a violation is going to be a negative experience. But from a city's perspective you took steps and came up with a, a way to address the issue without it being necessarily a huge negative that, that as a property owner, you obviously were trying to penalize the people who were doing something wrong, but it gave them a chance first. It gave them the opportunity to correct the issue. It wasn't necessarily, it shows up in the mail and there's a violation and there's a fine associated with it. It took a softer approach to deal with the issue. And I, I think from property owners that I've talked to in our experience, we've seen people far more accepting of it and really much happier with the program. Because like you said, compliance was the issue. You want people to just follow the rules. And especially in some of the areas that are, let's say, our, our struggle areas is more that campus core because we get so much turnover of people there. And every year it's kind of retraining them. And this approach here, I think, has done a great job of being able to step down in there and just let the new people know that, hey, this is the way it has to be and give them a chance to correct it without them being slapped with a fine immediately on it. So sure. it's, done a, it's done a great job. And honestly, I'll, I'll give a huge kudos to Mark on this stuff as well, too, because you know he's taken it upon himself to show up at our meetings, talk to landlords, talk to tenants, do a lot of stuff to really kind of get that word out there and kind of move that, that whole relationship in a good direction to get everybody where we need to be at. So I, I've been happy with it. So. Yeah, kind of one example of, of that, and, and Travis hit it right in the head, within the campus core, uh, these properties are turning over every year, every two years probably at the most, yep. so it, it's it's a pretty transient prop, uh, uh, area of the city, and for, for instance, um, I think I was on the job for a couple days and had a, a call or, or numerous emails from several students uh, concerned about the, the condition of the sidewalks around campus. So I went out there and, and literally in one day without breaking a sweat, I wrote 21 orders hmm. for sidewalk violations. Um, so when, when you I, say sidewalk violations, it's got to be snow. Right? Snow, snow ice. Or, or ice, you know, icy, un, unsafe condition. Uh, so if it is icy, we do require that they, they treat the ice, um, 
you know, the ice doesn't have to go away, but ultimately has to be something where it's not slippery and it's generally a safe condition for people to walk on. And that's definitely a very transient area of the city because most of the students are walking to classes mm -hmm. there. So uh, what I do now every year on the first big snowfall is I go on the campus core and use the pink slips and I put them on doors. And liter literally by the time I walk one to two blocks, I'll turn around and I would say 75% of those yeah. students are already out shoveling their sidewalk. I do it once and our compliance has dramatically increased in that area, which is one of the worst areas we had as far as compliance. So that that's one area where we put a little bit more effort in at the beginning of the season, that first snowfall, I'll go out and spend the time. But after that, it pays off because we don't have to follow up. With and it does pay off. And I think that's uh, it's a big part of your job is it's education. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I want to I want to qualify everything by saying we, you, me, Travis, uh, we don't get to debate whether the ordinance is right or wrong. Correct. Uh, and whether we agree with it or not. Our job, your job, is to enforce the rules that are on the book, much like police officers. If you don't agree with the law, change the law, but it's still a law, so we have to, we have to enforce it. Um, there are um, people who, who move here, uh, maybe not even students, but people who move here and, and may not know that we have an ordinance relating to uh, placement of your garbage cans or where you can park. Um, you know, some people have people that stay over, friends, relatives come over. Maybe they can't park on the, the concrete part of the driveway, but just for one night they park on the grass. Mm -hmm. Well, they may not know that that's against uh, our ordinances. Uh, we're working on ways, taking baby steps here and there to, to progress. As a matter of fact, we're talking about um, allowing on-street overnight parking now for no charge. It exists currently. I think there's a $3 nominal fee. Uh, you can do it online or pay at a kiosk. But uh, we, we evolve with our ordinances to see, is this really what we mean or do we mean something else? The, uh, talk about your, your reasoning behind the, the, the little pink slips, as you call them, just letting people know that, hey, this is a, a violation of ordinance um, and give them an opportunity to correct it, as opposed to what we were doing before. So it, it kind of goes back to, uh, with anything I do, it, it's easy. We work in, in government, and I think people look at us um, um, maybe as being the enemy. Um, or, I, I mean, yeah, I can't think yeah, of a better yeah, word, yeah, but the, honestly. The enforcer, think, yeah, the, the, the long arm of the city, uh, you can't fight city yeah, hall, there's, yeah. all, there's all that. So, so a, a couple things. To go back to what you talked about with ordinances, I do get calls from people that don't like our ordinances, and um, I usually refer them to two people, your office. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then, <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you for that. Yeah, <laughs> and their local alder person. Because the reality is we aren't perfect, and, and our ordinances aren't perfect. And if somebody has a suggestion on how to do things differently or better, you know, I'm all for that. So um, we constantly look at our ordinances and see if there's things we need to tweak or change. Mm -hmm. uh, to go back to your question on... Uh, um, you, you know, the, the, the pink slips or, or just how our notices come out of our office. Uh, I have tried to change the tone a little bit in those, although they are somewhat generic. I think uh, putting my, what, what, the point I was getting to is I try to put myself in the position of the person receiving the notice or the letter. Receiving a pink note on something that's, hey, it's just a reminder, you know, here's what our ordinance says, is much more friendly than you can't do this, you're going to get a $100 fine. Right. So, I think the tone was important, and again, people are more likely to learn and accept what's before them if it's not in a confrontational manner. So I tried to we tried to scale that back and, and really take a friendlier tone. Also with one of our uh, newly implemented programs, it's a neighbor helping neighbor grant. So if we issue an order for an exterior property violation, uh, it's owner occupied, there is a thousand dollar grant available to, to citizens or residents of uh, the city of Stevens Point to do exterior property improvements. Mm -hmm. So we, we've tried to also, uh, my other approach was, are we part of the problem or part of the solution? We have to be both. We have to, if we point out there's an issue, we also have to be a resource to potential solutions to, right. the, uh, to the residents. So I've really tried to do that and I think that's made a difference as well. Just, just so um, our, our listeners can, uh, can understand this better, what are the qualifications for that grant? We don't just give out $1,000 to anybody who asks. Yep. Um, there, are, there are qualifying guidelines. There are. Um, you can get uh, the information on our website, but in general, it's low to moderate income, mm -hmm. which follows standard uh, federal guidelines that are established for Portage County. If you fall within those income gu guidelines, it's uh, anybody that is owner-occupied, one or two fa family dwelling, and for exterior projects only, 
and for materials only. It does not cover labor, and it's up to a thousand dollar grant. Okay, and we'll we'll touch back on some of those programs because we have, there are some op options for um, volunteers to help with with some of the labor Absolutely. too that you've worked yes. with. I want to talk with uh, Travis a little bit to see. Um, so there there are challenging times with any property, right? Yep. Um, moving in and moving out is one of those. And that's not just rentals, right. that's owner occupied. You you clean out the attic, right? Uh, you, you've got a bunch of stuff. Um, some people want to help others and they'll put it to the curb with a, a free sign or, or, or something along those lines, but we have to be careful so it's not exposed to the elements. You know, you're leaving it out in the rain or the snow um, and we have ordinances regarding that. We'll talk about that a little bit, but what are some of the challenges specifically in this case for rental properties? And it's not just rental properties that have this. Yeah. When I moved out, I had an excessive amount of stuff we were getting rid of, um, but from a landlord perspective of the apartment association, what are some of the challenges that you see that um, maybe we've made some progress or, or challenges for us? Yeah, and, and you hit the nail on the head. That there are big, our big struggles are that move in and move out because you're dealing with, especially if you're if you're looking not to go back to campus Cora all the time, but that is one area where it's concentrated. So you tend to find the flaws there in, in that case. But when you get a large amount of people moving in and out, whether it's one time of the year or whether it's just sporadically throughout the year when people move, it's it creates. Usually, when I, I've moved, there's a lot of waste. There's things that you you pare down. There's things that you decide Why that you're just I keep yeah this? that you're just not going to use anymore. And a lot of times, you know, these things all tie together with the education aspect of it too. People a lot of times just don't realize that you can't just put things out on the curb. It just doesn't work that way. Especially, anymore. Yeah, not anymore. It Especially with the automated, you know, garbage pickup right. systems we have nowadays. There's no longer somebody out there who can just grab random things and throw them into um, a dump truck and, or a trash truck and take it away. So there's systems in place that the city has, and they're rightfully so. There's reasons why they're like this. Um, so you can't put large items out just whenever you want to. The city does have a bulk item removal, right. which we do encourage you know anybody who's moving to use. It's a super easy program. I think you can do it online now? You can yeah. do it online okay. and it's only $10. So yeah. yeah, you just if you search bulk item pickup on our website, it'll take you right to it. You can pay online and they'll pick it up Monday morning. Yep. At stevenspoint.com. Yep. So I mean, that's a great program because for 10 bucks, if you're like, that sofa has to go, it's great, you know. I I do appreciate the fact that people do try to put something out there and go free, you know, come and take it. Let's not put more stuff in the landfill. Exactly. But it also creates a problem of if they put it out there Tuesday morning, now it sits until next week Monday, and that can be an eyesore. Neighbors get upset about that. It you know, it can make their streets look cluttered and unclean. So I mean, there are aspects of that that it come along with education. So we're trying to tell people prior to move out. I know we do with prior to move out, we, we send out letters to everybody going, hey, just so you know, this service is available. Mm -hmm. Don't go sticking things out there because it's not going to get picked up. You're going to get fined and try to plan accordingly. We've taken some steps to try to educate landlords to notify their, their tenants sooner. Don't wait until move out week to tell them about bulk item stuff because like I said, if their pickups on Monday, and move out days on a Wednesday, right. you want them putting that out the week prior. Mm -hmm. So we've we've done some more education with that stuff. With your again with your pink slip program, we tried to take a little bit more of a proactive step with renters when they move in and when they move out to go, hey, here's some of the city ordinances that will almost directly impact your renting. Those things about not putting indoor furniture outside somewhere, making sure that garbage cans are properly stored where they should be, um, making sure that they're out on the proper days and then taken back in again. These are all things that you guys already touched upon that somebody new isn't gonna know these. And we can either sit back and wait and then it creates more work for Mark and the city, um, or we can try to be a little more proactive, which a lot of us have really kind of done to let the tenants know about it in advance. Um, and then if we see it, we try to let them know again as well too. We're trying to do the same thing that the city does. As, as a courtesy, get out there and talk to them quick. Let them know if there's something that, that we could do better. The, I guess some of the, the, the working togetherness that we've, we've had, we've, we've really tried as an apartment association and the city to look at things that are problems that, that our two worlds kind of collide on, and what can we find for solutions on those there? The move out process was one of them, and I think this is one that, that Mark and I both saw over the last couple of years, especially when we get people moving out and there's a lot of garbage and a lot of things get tossed, that if we can get out there and we can let tenants know and we can get things picked up quicker, the city has graciously gone the route of trying to give us a little bit of latitude going, we're not gonna hit you with a fine right away, but we understand the time of the year, keep it moving though. And we've tried to step up the plate and do that. And I don't know if you- Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think 
one thing I did at the very beginning of this process when I was hired is reach out to the landlords. And I think, um, I don't know that that relationship was the best at the beginning of oh, this no. process, <laughs> but um, I, I think it has evolved. I think there's a, a, a tremendous amount of respect between oh, both yeah. parties. I think uh, the landlords have done a great job of not only kind of helping each other out, but really helping to educate. So again, the education component, landlords have done a much better job, I believe, in educating their tenants. So it's not only what we've done, but really the landlords working with the city and, and helping to educate their tenants as to what their responsibilities well, are. And that's really what it is. And I preach about this all the time, about how we're, we're a community. We're all in this together. It's not you versus me versus them versus us, whatever it happens to be. We're in this together. So it makes sense that we solve our problems together. Mm -hmm. You talk about the cooperation between the, the Central Wisconsin Department Association and the city and other landlords, but you also work with government organizations, student government organizations, yes. because a portion of the rental property in the city is student rentals. Yep. Um, arguably, the, there's a fair amount of focus on that college core because, again, it's concentrated, so you see it more. Yeah. Um, but I know that the Apartment Association and, and the city has worked with Student Government Association. Talk a little bit about that relationship, and I know it gets a little challenging because SGA turns over every year. Yeah. Um, so you, you have to start that process almost over again every year. But Travis, talk a little bit about that. It, it, you hit the nail on the head with that, too. It, it is a bit of a challenge because we got new people every year coming into it, and as much as you try to make sure that information flows evenly and, and through to the next one, it's, it doesn't always happen. But part of it is just stepping back and going, this is, what, this is the process. It's not, a, it's not a negative against the so, uh, SGA or any student government organization or student organization for that fact. It's just more the reality that we deal with with turnover. That's more the thing there. And we try to partner with them on as much as we can because we have common goals. You know, we want to provide good quality housing in that campus area. We want it kept up nicely. We're looking for good tenants. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of common ground here. They want great places to live. They want it close to campus. We have a lot of things that really, I think, mesh well together. Um, you know, we've, we've partnered with them for the last few years on doing housing fairs to bring landlords to the university to get in front of their students for them. So that way, busy students who rightfully so after school kicks off, um, they're not having to try to run all over the place. We're essentially bringing the landlords to them where they can come on in quick and see a lot of places in a real short period of time. Yeah. We've partnered up and we do educational events, um, which we have one of those you know, scheduled in the near future here, where we're gonna go in front of a bunch of students. We're gonna give them a lot of information about city, about, you know, legal, about renting in general, much to what my pe people might not understand this, but we want an educated renter. We want somebody who knows things well. I mean, we want somebody who can go into a property and look at things and ask good questions and ask smart questions and find a good place to live. Um, these educational events, we've definitely seen a benefit from that. Good. Prior to years before this, when people came in, it's they didn't know the questions to ask. You're, you're a first-time renter. You've never done it before. Right. So they just they come through and they don't know what they don't know. So our goal has been to kind of get out there and go, here's the questions you should be asking and why. Mm -hmm. Here's what you should be looking for when you go into a tour property and why. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps them get into a better property that fits their needs. It creates less conflict. Um, there's not something where, where they've, they've rented a place they're going to regret later because they didn't do their due diligence. Um, you know, and from our end of it there, having a tenant who understands their obligations is a, is a good thing. We don't want a bait and switch. Nobody's, nobody's doing leases out there that, you know, is trying to get a gotcha in there. We want everybody to upfront know, here's what we expect from you. Here's what you expect from us. And we'll have a great relationship with that. And that's kind of what the goal is is going towards with that. Yeah, and, and that's important to note too, kind of uh, what's expected of the tenants and what can be expected uh, or should be expected uh, from the landlord's mm -hmm. perspective. Yep. Uh, and we also will throw in that disclaimer that not every landlord is responsible and righteous and not every right. tenant mm -hmm. is diligent and, and you know, uh, a, responsible. So we're not going to make everybody happy. Correct. But Mark, some of the education that Travis had talked about uh, comes directly from your office. And, and talk a little bit about the, the brochures and the things that you've done. Yeah. Um, the educational event is, is something I'm, I'm really proud of, actually. It's, uh, to my knowledge, the only one that's done like that in the state, because we are a university uh, town. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did about two years ago was, was set up this educational event 
designed or geared towards second year students looking to move off campus because they're eligible after two years on campus mm -hmm. to move off campus. Uh, we started doing that. Now we are educating roughly 100 students per year. We do two classes, one each semester. We get about 50 students per semester, and those are all oh. second year students looking to move off campus. Uh, so the response has been tremendous. I, I think that's one of the reasons we've seen a lot of positive results. Not only have we seen positive results, the students that have taken that class have said they learned a lot. You know, it was really that one hour was was well worth their time to come and, and take the class. Plus, we give them free pizza, so that certainly <laughs> doesn't doesn't hurt. That helps with the yeah, yeah. It doesn't 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 hurt. So, um, but no, we talk about uh, SGA Legals there, the Apartment Owners Association. Travis is as they're usually a rep representative. Uh, PD is there, and myself. So we talk about. Uh, the police ordinances, um, Center for Prevention, Dean you know, of Students. So it's kind of a little bit, we each get about 10 or 15 minutes to talk to the students, and uh, it, it has been a very positive experience uh, for them as, as well as, as us. Uh, as far as other brochures, we do have, if you just go to the City of Stevens Point's website and you search uh, FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, mm -hmm. this brochure will come up as well as a number of other whether it's burning, um, grass, trash, pickup, any of those things, you can find those on our website. Again, just searching FAQ. It'll yeah, and it's important to note, too, that not only do we have StevensPoint.com, mm -hmm. uh, but we have our own mobile app now. So if you search Stevens Point uh, in Android or, or um, the iTunes Store, um, App Store, you will find this, the Stevens Point app. Uh, and John Quirk, who's our community media manager, has done a fabulous job over the years of updating that to get information out. Because really, education is the key. We want people to know um, what's expected of them, and we, in turn, then know um, what to expect. So it's, uh, it's very helpful in that regard. Getting back, because we just got a few minutes left, um, talk about some of the opportunities. Maybe I have a... a a rough problem, hmm. and I might have the financial means, but I'm too old or too uh, overweight, not a shape to get up on the roof anymore. Uh, and I meet the income qualifications. Sure. What what sources do you send them to? Just a couple examples. Yeah, yeah. So first off, contact me directly, and I can walk them through the application. I'll ask them just a few basic questions. And how does someone contact you, Mark? They can contact me. Uh, my information is, is contact information that's on the website, either via email, uh, mark or mcordus at stevenspoint.com. K-O-R-D-U-S, correct. Uh, or 346-1554 is my phone number, my direct line. And uh, they can contact me directly. I'll walk them quickly through the application, just ask them a few questions to make sure they qualify. Uh, if they, again, that only is for materials through that grant program. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do have several community-based organizations, a few local churches that have worked with local residents. They have labor and they can do it. Uh, so it really works well if, if we can provide the money for, let's say, painting or you know, repairing a roof or you know, replacing a window or a door or something like that. Uh, I can usually find labor to, to help them with that process. Okay. Um, yeah, and I know I worked with, I, I got approached by one of the uh, fraternal organizations on campus that were looking to kind of make a difference. And I just uh, actually connected them with an elderly lady that lives on the west side that needs a portion of her house Perfect. painted. She had, they somebody came and painted um, probably two-thirds of her house. Mm -hmm. She paid them the full amount, and she's never seen uh, them again, unfortunately. So this group has stepped up, and uh, they are going to paint the rest of the house first. That, that was actually a nice story. So um, just in our few minutes left, Mark, talk about some of the, the common violations that you see. With winter coming up, obviously, clearing your sidewalks is, is one of those. Sure. Uh, what are the rules in regards to clearing your sidewalk from snow or ice or, or some of the other common sure. violations? Uh, snow and ice is a big one in the winter. Uh, snow covers most of the other violations for the rest of the winter. So <laughs> as far as other typical cold violations, it, it's kind of quiet for us. But uh, the rules and regulations regarding snow removal from your sidewalk. If there is a boulevard section, meaning uh, you have a grass strip between your sidewalk and your curb, mm -hmm. you have 24 hours to remove that snow after the snowfall event. Um, okay. Uh, stops. So if you have a series of kind of snowfall over a day or two, it's whenever that snowfall event stops, you have 24 hours to remove that snow. Okay. If there is no boulevard section, meaning the curb goes right up to the sidewalk, there's no grass strip, you have 48 hours to remove the snow at that point from the stop of that uh, snow. And that's event. because it's usually a little more difficult to move the snow rather than piling it up in the boulevard, you have to put it up in your yard, which you should be doing anyway, Correct. Just, just for clarification, Correct. because those snow banks in the boulevard can get pretty high. It's always best to put the snow in your yard uh, and 
it and keep it that way. That is correct. On top of it, those are usually more heavily traveled roads and they get more snowplow activity. Mm -hmm. So typically the plows will, um, much to the chagrin of those of those people that live along those areas, will will get more um, snow and slush on their sidewalks. So it's a little bit more of a um, undertaking to keep that sidewalk clean. How about parking on the, the grass? Uh, even even dirt? in the winter time, I realize it's frozen. I realize there's snow there. You still can't do it. Uh, so okay. yeah, that's a big one. Probably one of the most common we see is is people parking on the grass. Stevens Point, older city, especially the downtown core areas. There's very little parking and. Uh, there is that temptation to park on the grass. The one thing we do have in the ordinance now that wasn't there in the past is we do allow expansion with gravel. Um, in the past, it was just blacktop and uh, mm -hmm. concrete. So you can expand a gravel driveway, which I don't know if a lot of people are aware of that, but that is allowed as an expansion material for hard surface. Yeah, and we don't want everybody expanding the, the entire yard for gravel parking, of course. C correct. Um, ideally, I say this a lot, if there was a uh, a law that we can make that say, you know, be reasonable, be friendly mm -hmm. to your neighbors, be responsible. Um, it would cover all of these things, but it's that's not reality. Well, or uh, depending on what happens with overnight parking uh, on street, because we have that, that surface available to us in, in the city, and, and that may change in the near future as well. Okay. Travis, from the the Apartment Association's perspective, yep. what are the, some of the things that you see that maybe people who are watching and listening uh, should be made aware of? Um, it, in regards to the violation aspect of things, or even just the property maintenance aspect mm -hmm. of things, the, it's timely as we're coming into winter. The shoveling, I don't think we can emphasize that enough. The, the idea of, you know, people walking and trampling on stuff and making it much more difficult mm -hmm. to get your snow removed, it, it, if that alone isn't incentive enough to get out there right away and, and remove it, I don't know what is. Um, it's Slip and falls in winter are, are a huge thing, and we, we obviously want to do whatever we can to minimize that. I don't want anybody slipping and falling on our property, whether we're responsible for it, for the storm removal, or whether a tenant's responsible for it, because I don't want them in, in that scenario either. So I would say that, that that's one of the things we try to emphasize a lot is, Get out there, take care of the snow, mitigate the ice as fast as you possibly can. Do, you have 24 hours, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you need to take to 24 hours. We, we try to get out there and on properties where they're multifamily, we'll try to get it done as quickly as possible um, and take care of it. We, I, we encourage residents to kind of do the same thing too um, in regards to that stuff. So. All right, uh, and Mark and Travis, um, one thing that we haven't touched on yet, we got uh, just under two minutes left here, um, is the voluntary inspection program. The voluntary, uh, the state always sticks their fingers in, in local government to tell us what's in our best interest, uh, which made it very difficult to do inspections. Talk about the voluntary inspection program real briefly. I'll just give a very brief overview. Uh, that was kind of a combination of the apartment owners, the city, and SGA as well. Because SGA said, well, we want to ensure safe housing. How do we know what housing is safe and, mm -hmm. and not safe? And, that, and, and so one thing we came up with, uh, because we can't, we don't have a mandatory inspection program anymore. The state has changed some laws and we can't do that. Uh, so we came up with the idea of, of a voluntary uh, program, which Travis is one of the people that's participated in that program. We go through and, and kind of do a cursory inspection it's not in depth but it's really just basic health and safety issues a checklist of i think around 30 items or so yep. and uh it, it's from our perspective has worked well uh, we've gotten positive feedback from students and uh, as well as the the few landlords that uh, participated where in can i find a list of people who are landlords who comply with this voluntary inspection it's on our website under if i I believe you do a search under voluntary rental inspection, or if they contact me directly, I can provide it as well. But uh, I Great. believe the, the list is on the website. Well, you know, we could probably have a whole other show on some of this stuff, oh, yeah. but we're, we're running out of time here. So Mark, our neighborhood improvement coordinator, Mark, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Travis, uh, representing the Central Wisconsin Apartment Association. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And I know winter's coming up. There's always challenges. Winter stinks in Wisconsin. But <laughs> I think together we can, we can make things happen and, and try and keep our community community safe for those who walk uh, to school or, or live in our community. Definitely. So, until next time, um, I'm Mayor Mike and we've been Talking Point.